title of my sermon this morning, The Joy of Attending Church. Do you know where I'm going? <laughs> One of the great uh, sources of joy in my life is coming to church. Even if I wasn't a preacher, I would love to come to church. I would come in the morning and in the evening and on Wednesday and every time it's open because I just love coming to church. It might be a reason why I actually became a preacher. You know, they say if you do what you love. So I'm disappointed when I can't be here for some reason and I'm equally disappointed when some of you are not here as well because when I'm not here because of illness usually or I have to travel, one of the conversations that my wife and I have when she comes home from church, let's say I've got a cold or the flu or something, is, so what happened? Who'd you see? What went on? What did he preach about? What were the announcements? You know, I, I think everybody has that kind of experience. You want to know what, what went on. So I want to talk about church attendance this morning, but not in a negative way. I don't want to create guilt or accuse or shame anybody about this topic. It's a big guilt producer. Actually, I want to give you reasons to come. I want to give you motivation to be faithful to all services, positive reinforcement for those who attend regularly, and encouragement for, well, for those who don't. But first, I want us to look at some uh, statistics. There we go. Now the image that you're seeing is, the, is actually the oldest bulletin that we have in our archive. I know that we've had bulletins uh, earlier than uh, October 1977, but we, 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 didn't keep, we only started keeping them for whatever reason in October 1977, so we have this one in our archives. I want you to note who the elders are, if you can see it up there. Big enough? Don Coffey, who is no longer with us, who's passed on, and Harold Weaver. Harold Weaver became an elder when he was eight years old. It's just, <laughs> it's just amazing the wisdom that he had at an early age. And of course, the deacons, Jack Gately, Calvin Lastly, James Masoner, we know him, Lem Larson, B. Larson's husband, Sheldon Mitchell, and look at the minister, Lewis Thompson. Lewis Thompson was the minister. I want you to note also the um, articles, the two articles on the inside of the bulletin. Probably not able to read them from back there, but uh, both articles were about maintaining a strong commitment to church attendance on Sunday and Wednesday. Imagine, 1977, we're talking about, hey, let's be faithful to church attendance. Now the really interesting part of this bulletin is the back page. The back page that has the statistics from that period. The Sunday Bible class attendance from that period, 204 people. The Sunday worship attendance from that period, 252 people. Wednesday night, 160. Wednesday service, excuse me, Sunday evening service, 160. Wednesday night, 158. What's really significant, it's not up there, but it's the, it's the percentages. The percentages at that time, 204. I've got the wrong slide, that's my next slide. Just hold on to that one. Think about this for a minute. Sunday Bible class, 204 in those days. Sunday worship, 252, that meant 81% of the congregation were present for Bible class in 1977. 63% of the church came back for Sunday night. 62% were there on Wednesday. So this is my slide now. Let's fast forward and look at the statistics for the year 2000. The year 2000, Sunday Bible class, 234. Sunday worship average, 401. The percentage of people who came to Bible class on Sunday morning, 58%. 58% of the people in this congregation would come for Bible class in 2000. Pretty big drop from 
81% to 58%. We didn't have any stats for Wednesday night or Sunday night. Now for the statistics of the present year, 2012. Sunday Bible class, 153. Sunday worship, 304, 50%. Gone down another 8%. Again, we don't have any stats available for Sunday night and Wednesday, although I can say we average perhaps 40 to 50% Wednesday and Sunday. Now, have you noticed a trend here? You know, statistics don't lie. It's not a preacher count. We've gone from 81% of the congregation attending Bible class to barely 50% in 30 years. You wonder, you know, what's, what's going on? What's happening? There could be a lot of reasons offered. You know, people have busier lives. There's less interest in Bible study than in the past. All kinds of reasons that people offer for this. However, no matter what reason is given, there's a common factor that explains the lack of commitment represented in these statistics. And that is a decrease in personal faith. I know you might argue, oh, I, my faith hasn't gone down, but the stats are there. You see, there's a vicious cycle at work here. Since faith is uh, built and maintained through the hearing of God's word, Romans 10, 17, when we neglect doing so, our faith is weakened as well as our spiritual enthusiasm for worship and Bible study. You know, the Holy Spirit says your faith is built up as you hear God's word. The less you hear God's word, the less your faith is built up. And so the result is that the less we hear the word, the less we want to hear it, the less we fill ourselves with the word, the more we are filled with the world, because there's no vacuum inside of us. It's either the word or the world, and there's always a competition there. And the cycle sees us usually, in my experience, it sees us first neglecting, well, Bible study, on Sunday, then you know, getting into the habit of skipping Sunday nights, not that important. Before long, we don't see the need to be here on Wednesdays either. The end result is that we eventually become part of the 50% not here for study and worship most of the time. We belong to that 50%. Like I said at the beginning, my goal here is not guilt, it's motivation. So for the 50% here all the time and the 50% here only for Sunday worship, let me give you several reasons to rejoice when you do attend worship. First of all, you have the joy of obedience. Ever since the formation of the Jewish nation, God has clearly commanded that His people gather to worship Him publicly. And Jesus was one of those. He was a Jew. And it says, and he came to Nazareth when he had been brought up, or excuse me, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, that's the key word, his custom, that's what he did. That was his habit. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Even Jesus himself obeyed this command. As a matter of fact, he and his family traveled every year to Jerusalem for the religious observances, 70 miles plus. They'd walk it both ways, shut down the business, shut down the shop so they could go to Jerusalem. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the writer continues this expression of God's will for his people today. He says, and let us consider to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. He's talking about the 50% and the 50%. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now in earlier chapters, the Hebrew writer explains that we have better reasons to celebrate when we gather to worship than those who did so in the Old Testament. You know, we have an accomplished salvation. They had a salvation they were still looking forward to. We know who the Messiah is. We know Him intimately. They didn't, they were waiting. 
we have a clearer understanding of our heavenly reward. And they only saw it far off in the distance. When we gather to worship, we obey God. And there is a great joy in our hearts knowing that we are doing what God wants us to do. You know, the reasons that we use to skip Bible class or Wednesday services are never supplied to us by God or His Word. Go find it. Tell me where it is in the Old Testament that says, well, you come when you feel like it. Go ahead, show me that verse. That little voice inside that says, you know, you know, why, don't, why, you know why don't you just, it's important. You know? When I was in Canada, hockey, hockey was important. In a hockey mad country like Canada, man, there was practice hockey, hockey Sunday, hockey Saturday, hockey Wednesday, all the time hockey. But the voice inside my head that said, you know, Paul, he loves hockey, he's actually very good at it, he could even turn pro if he really bore down on it, you know? Every Wednesday practice, every second Sunday away games. That little voice inside of me that was saying, you know, he's, your son is really good, he could really go far, blah, blah, blah. Was that Jesus talking to me? Was that His word that was encouraging me? Regardless of the obstacles, coming to church is the right thing to do and doing the right thing feels good. Coming to church also gives us the joy of confessing Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11.26, Paul says that when we share communion, we're proclaiming Christ. Public communion is a collective demonstration of our faith. You know, we've had the elections recently. Every time they showed a rally, you know, signs were up. You know, whoever you voted for, who was your man, who was your ticket, and whatever you know, issue that you were supporting. You know, people carried signs, they were making a demonstration. Well, when we take communion, as we have this morning, we are proclaiming, we're making a demonstration, a public demonstration of who and what we believe. I have the joy of knowing that when I am here with my brothers and sisters, I am confessing Jesus' name, something I cannot do from the couch at my house. Even if I'm not been able to witness Christ throughout the week, the Lord provides me with an opportunity to do so here every Lord's Day. In Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says that those who confess His name here on earth, He will reciprocate and confess their names before the Father in heaven. So I have great joy when I come to church because my presence here signals the fact that Jesus is confessing my name and your name at this very moment in heaven. So, I have the joy that comes from obedience. I have the joy that comes from witnessing Christ. I also have the joy of helping other people. Again, in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, we see that the apostle directed the churches to put money aside to help the poor. When I come to church, I have the joy of giving my money and time to things done in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ. Now there are a lot of good causes that we can give to that help people, absolutely. And many of us, many of you do that. The Red Cross and the City Mission, you know, just good things, people doing good things in the world. However, only the church does good things in the name of Christ. The Red Cross, they've taken the cross, but they're not really doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. To give for the glory of Christ is pleasing to God. I therefore have a double joy. I have the joy that comes from giving, because Jesus said that giving is more blessed than receiving in Acts 20, 35. And I also have the joy that comes from doing something that makes God smile. Forgive the metaphor, the human. But God is joyful when we give in the name of Christ. If you wanted to motivate yourself in the area of giving, just imagine what you'd give if it was Jesus Himself passing the plate or doing the count. 
Imagine the Lord sitting in the elders conference room Sundays and just opening up the check and seeing, I won't mention the name, seeing so and so. You gave what? Surely there's a zero missing here. <laughs> we have to ask ourselves, will God be pleased with my offering? Will I know that kind of joy this morning? Coming to church also gives me the joy of knowing God more intimately. In Ephesians 1.17, Paul tells us that it is possible to know God intimately. Like being in love. You know in the Bible it says, and he knew her. And the Bible says, and he knew her, that to know means to know intimately between a man and a woman. It's the same word here, to know God intimately, that relationship. In John 17, three, Jesus says that the knowledge of God is the essence of the experience referred to as eternal life in the Bible. Yes, eternal life, I'm going to have eternal life as a Christian, life that never ends, but it also refers to a quality of life. What kind of life is that going to be? What will be the experience? And so in the resurrection, God will give us a glorious body. Why? So that we can continue to know Him eternally. In John 6, 63, Jesus says that the way to know God and experience that eternal life for the Christian is through the knowledge of God's word. The more we know the word, listen, the more we know the word, the more we taste eternal life. In Acts 2.42, the early Christians devoted themselves, devoted themselves. You know, I like that word devote there in the Greek, it means to cling to. It's like if you're in a boat, in a sailboat, and there's you know, Hurricane Sandy, you're devoting yourself to the main mast pole. Why? Because you don't want to be blown off the ship. They were devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. Why? In order to know God more perfectly. In the same way I come to know God and experience the first fruits of my eternal life as I grow in the knowledge of His word, and that growth begins here in the church, and it works its way into every part of my life. You know, some people mistakenly believe that by cutting back on church attendance, they're going to improve their careers or they're going to improve their family life when the opposite is what's actually true. Less church, less joy in every area of life. My experience has shown me that those who do this are neither happier nor are they more enlightened about spiritual matters. Finally, church attendance creates the joy of fellowship. You know, the songs that we share, the prayers that we make on behalf of one another, the tender offers of help and encouragement, the holy atmosphere, all of these and more make the sharing of this experience a joyful thing. I am genuinely happy when I am here because there is no place in the world like heaven. And in this world, there's no place closer to heaven than the church, where the kingdom of heaven exists. The church is the kingdom of heaven on earth. If you don't believe me, try comparing what goes on here to a football game or your workplace or school, and you will see the difference. And the difference is that here we not only have fellowship with each other, we also have it with Jesus, who is the source of our joy. Now when I preach a lesson about church attendance, there's invariably someone who will come up to me later, or someone you know, who is thinking, well, all this joy business is okay, but Do I have to come every service? 
Is it a sin if I don't come Wednesday or Sunday night? Am I doing something wrong if I don't come for a Bible class? Always, I always get that. You're forewarned now. So let me answer that question. You know, come on, let's talk, you know, the elephant in the room, let's, let's deal with it. When someone asks that question, it usually reflects a poor spiritual attitude to begin with. Anybody here who's taught school knows that. You, know, you hand out the assignment and there's always one kid in the back says, so how many words exactly does the essay have to have? How many pages? Uh, Miss, do we have to do all the problems on the sheet? She said, page 22, do the problems on page 22. Miss, do we also have to do like the bonus questions too, Miss? That's that guy. This is the kind of attitude that wants to do only the basic things required. An attitude that wants to know the minimum service necessary in order to please God. Lord, tell me, what do you want? Minimum, minimum. It shows that we're not trying to love God with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole body. It reveals uh, lukewarm. There's a little heat, but not much. If my attitude is right with God, it will be reflected in my attitude about church and church attendance. You see, attitude towards the church is a mirror of our attitude towards God. If we love the Lord, we should love being with His brothers and sisters. What did Jesus say? My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. Also, if we love the Lord, we should be seeking first His kingdom, not last. And seeking His kingdom cannot be done without a serious involvement in church. And I'm saying serious involvement in church. Those who may think that church is not that important forget that Jesus died in order to create the church. So instead of asking the question, is it a sin if I don't come or do I have to attend at every service? I have a better question that you should ask. What can I do to make my church attendance more joyful? That's a better question. Hopefully the things that I've talked about today will start you on the path to more faithful and joyful church attendance. I want to go back to statistics as we close out. 2001. In 2001, the potential of this congregation, the potential, meaning in our directory, living, breathing members and their children, 529. Many of us forget, and some of us were not here, but this auditorium used to only go to where the line is back there, where, the, where that row is back there. There's a reason why we spent, what, $600,000, $700,000 in renovating and adding an additional 10,000 square feet to this building. That was because our potential attendance was 529. If we had a you know, pack the pew day in 2001, we were looking for 529 people to show up. And the average Bible class, 273. Average worship, 382. 71% of the people who came to Bible class, I mean, who came to worship had also come to Bible class. In 2012, our potential, 405. Bible class average, 153. Worship average, 304. Percentage, 50%. You know, I want those who really want the church to reverse this trend and begin to grow again to take the first step in that direction. Start attending Sunday Bible classes with your family if you're not already doing so. Neglect of this is what started the decline in this congregation and a return to this first and foremost will stop the slide, turn it around. I'd like to have another building project where we have to you know, overcome the size limitation of this 
auditorium. Marty was right, that big, you know, every Pack the Pew Sunday years ago, over 500 people, yeah, because the auditorium can hold barely 500 people. I'd like to get to the point where Pack the Pew was 800 people, 1,000 people, worshiping God. And if you're already doing this, then add Sunday night or Wednesday to your schedule. Brothers and sisters, less of the world, more of the kingdom. That's what we need right here. That's what we need right here. You might not be happy me telling you, but that's what we need. Finally, I also want you to take note of our December 2nd. Thank you, Marty, for you know, explaining that. Homecoming Sunday, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, kick off a brand new Bible class quarter. Our theme this year will be fervent in spirit. Do you see a, a, a connection between my lesson this morning and the theme coming? Fervent in spirit. That's what's pleasing to God. People who are fervent in spirit. I don't know much about football. You know I'm not a huge football fan, but you know what? OU fans and OSU fans are fervent. If we could just get the fervency from the football into the kingdom, be great. We also have a special guest speaker, Dr. John Harrison from, he's a New Testament, professor of New Testament from OC, great speaker, very knowledgeable man, very edifying to hear him. And also the Congregational Fellowship Meal catered and served and we say by the men of the congregation, because let's face it, ladies, you're the one that do all the work, right? You do all the work when it comes to those things. The guys go in, they eat, they sit down, they visit, fold some tables up at the end and say, man, what a day, I'm tired, man, is the game on? I'm going to have to lay down to watch the game. So we're going to, at least at this event, try to encourage our sisters to go straight in and sit down, get your food, sit down and enjoy the time and we'll, we'll take care of the serving for the change. The elders and the ministers are happy to have as many of the 405 members of this congregation here for this special day. So I invite anyone here, of course, who needs the prayers of the church, that is always the invitation, needs to be baptized, needs to be restored to come forward now, of course. And I also invite everyone here to recommit to joyful church attendance. Yeah, there it is. Whenever the saints meet, whenever the saints meet, I encourage all the saints to meet. If you need the prayers of the church or any type of encouragement now, we encourage you to come forward as Johnny leads us in a song of encouragement.